TikTok is potentially getting banned in the United States, and there's a lot of agents absolutely freaking out right now. And so today, I bring on Noah Ward, who's been on my channel before, but as a 23-year-old, Noah's been closing over six figures per month in GCI for free from his TikTok entirely. And so you might wonder, what does somebody like that have to say about the proposed TikTok ban that might be coming up? And what's he doing right now in order to address it and make sure that he secures his business? And that's what we're going to be diving into today. So we're bringing on Noah and he's first going to talk about the details of the potential ban, what might happen, what is likely to happen, and some of the different outcomes. Then Noah's going to talk about what he's doing right now in order to protect himself and make sure that that six figures a month doesn't just disappear and what everybody else that's leveraging TikTok as a realtor should be doing now to protect your business. And at the end of the video, he even breaks down the ninja strategies that he used from going from a brand new agent in a brand new city who didn't know anybody to breaking six figures a month over 100k in GCI from this ninja strategy, tapping into something that not many people do and is a gold mine if you can do it. So before bringing on Noah, two quick things. I will link his content below because not only does he have an incredible TikTok profile, but also an amazing YouTube channel that you want to check out. And I'll link his calendar below because if you're leveraging TikTok, you probably want to partner with people who are also leveraging it at the highest level, but also know what to do when things go sideways like they very well might which we will talk about. So book a call with him and chat about getting his support and he's helped a ton of agents crush it, leveraging TikTok. So let's bring on Noah Ward and talk all things TikTok ban for realtors. All right, Noah, so super excited to have you here, man, to talk about a really hot topic, which is the potential ban of TikTok for realtors and everybody in the United States. You know, there's a lot of agents that are leveraging TikTok, people seeing incredible success like yourself, and a lot of people are kind of on edge, nervous, worried about what this could mean for their business going forward. So, uh, dude, super grateful to have you here again, uh, multiple time person on the channel and uh, excited for you to maybe unpack your journey first of what your journey has been like with TikTok before getting into your perspective on what might happen and how to mitigate it. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you uh, having me on for, I think, the third time now, I think this is. So it's exciting yeah. and a lot has changed. I mean, every video that we've done, there's been a lot of different changes that have gone on. So. Yeah, it's definitely been a whirlwind of events that have happened since our first video that we made. Um, but a lot of it, like I said, and I've told you before, is it's honestly all come from TikTok, which seems crazy for a lot of people because everyone, depending on your demographic, it's, oh, TikTok is just a dancing app or TikTok has no business application. Like that has been the saying time and time again since TikTok came into existence. And it honestly couldn't be further from the truth because like getting into the business at 19 years old, I got my Wisconsin real estate license at age 20. I got my Florida real estate license when I made the move from Wisconsin to Florida. So across the country, did not know one single person in this entire area. So, I mean, I didn't have any sphere of influence to leverage. I had no one basically to leverage. And that's kind of where you came into play. And we were starting to talk about leveraging video and going into more in depth on the video marketing side of things. And for some reason, I just really wanted to go into TikTok. I don't know if it was because it was short form video versus doing long form on YouTube. Um, but I just thought that doing short form video may be a little bit more beneficial for me just because at the time, you know, I was 20 years old. Um, now I'm 23. So a lot has changed in the past three years. But getting onto TikTok, I mean, at the time, you know, it was still a very, it was in its infancy stage and it still is technically today, uh, but it's changed a lot in the past three years. But getting into TikTok, I mean, it's allowed me to meet, meet some amazing people from not only here in Sarasota, Florida, or even the country, but worldwide, I've been able to meet up with a lot of great investors um, from South America, Chile, Brazil, all these areas. And some of my builders actually today are from the Brazil area. And they found me from, you know, leveraging video marketing. And, you know, I'll, I'll say short form video, meaning TikTok and Instagram reels combined, um, but mainly from TikTok. And, you know, what's crazy is that I've been able to get, you know, from here, I've been able to grow my following to a little over 40,000 followers just in the hyper local market here in Sarasota. I mean, that's all I talk about is just Sarasota in general. I may talk about like Southwest Florida, but mainly for me, it's just been a lot in the Sarasota area, showing houses, showing what it's like to live here, 
showing some restaurants. It's just basically what it's like to live in Sarasota and what people can expect. Because as you all know, Florida is a destination state, so everyone loves to see what other people can do or what other cities offer compared to where they may be living. So I really wanted to highlight that in TikTok. And I think that's what really gave me an edge on TikTok was being able to just showcase, not really talk about me because I don't really care about me is like, oh, you know, flaunting me and like, oh, look at me. Right. Um, so I just really wanted to showcase Florida. I never really even put myself in the videos for like the home tours. I don't jump around during the home tours. I just literally show the houses. Um, and I mean, some people like it, some people don't do it, um, but it's all personal preference. I, I personally like doing that. Uh, but for me, I found a lot of success doing those home tour videos. I mean, I think the largest video I've had is like 3.2 million views. Um, but some of my other house tour videos were getting like a half a million, couple hundred thousand views. Um, it just very, it just ranges depending on the style of a house, um, and the time of year. Um, but yeah, so for me, TikTok has also allowed me, which I didn't think, right. I thought I would maybe get a few listings here and there, but for me, TikTok was basically my leverage point. You know, and a lot of people say, well, how is that? Right. And a lot of it comes indirectly. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've met some people on here that are local to Sarasota. And I honestly, they have been one of my best clients and one of my biggest clients. Um, and I think we've done about like seven million dollars in volume just between them in the past like 12 months or so. Um, so I'm very fortunate for them because they have been amazing. And it, they found me strictly from TikTok. So I was able to like, just to put this into perspective, I found a seller that was, he reached out to me and I was, and I, I can say this now because he's probably not watching this, but I was in my deer stand in November in Wisconsin hunting, deer hunting. And I got a text from this guy saying, Hey Noah, I've been watching you on TikTok now for several months. You seem very knowledgeable about the Sarasota area. I have this new renovation project that um, I'm almost completed and I want you to sell it for me. And it was like, there was no questions asked or anything like that. It, that. He was literally just like, Noah, I want you to sell my house. I asked him, okay, cool. Uh, what price point are you looking for? He was like 1.5, $1.8 million. And at the time I was like, well, I'm leaving for Wisconsin in the next couple of days. So how about we just meet up on Monday the following week, right? And I didn't tell him where I was at or anything. Uh, but it, it was just funny because then I had a $1.5 million off market listing from TikTok which then I paired it with one of my investors that I mentioned earlier in Sarasota. And so I basically double ended that deal for, I think it was like 1.55 million. Um, and that's strictly came from TikTok because that investor also came from TikTok. He's been watching me on TikTok for like six plus months. And at the time I was like 20 years old and he was like, Hey Noah, you know, I've been watching on TikTok. You seem very outgoing. You seem like, you know, about the area. I don't want to work with all these like older agents here. And I feel like you guys would be a great fit. Plus we have a lot of other properties that are coming up. Let's go have a meeting. Right. And that meeting, that one meeting probably changed kind of my perspective on the power of TikTok because now I hold a three and a half million dollar listing from them. I hold probably about six other million dollars in volume right now in current listings just from them alone. Uh, so that's like nine million right there just from these guys. And it, it's just crazy because he they, he came specifically from TikTok and I can keep going down the laundry list of all the different stories from TikTok, but it's honestly been just a huge relationship building platform for me because I get introduced, even if some people may not sell, right? They may or buy. They're like, hey, Noah, I love, I see what you're doing on TikTok. You're very outgoing. Like you are putting yourself out there and I can really admire that. Like business owners here in Sarasota. And so we reach out, we grab a coffee and then it leads to something else. Oh, well, you got to go meet so-and-so, right? And it just keeps going down the rabbit hole of like, oh, well, you should meet this person. You should meet that person. And it, that's what I absolutely love about TikTok is you're just basically putting yourself out there and casting a wide net for other people to take a look, right? And it, honestly, that's like, that's my main priority is being able to build quality relationships. I, I prioritize relationships over transaction and transactions. And I think a lot of people do respect that. And I will continue to do that in every phase of business that I'm in is prioritizing these relationships because that's what TikTok taught me is don't go straight for the check. Don't go straight for the commission check. Just go straight for the relationship, build that relationship, build it out. Because at the end of the day, that one relationship could lead to 20 other transactions in the next 12 months. Like you just never know. 
And I could not say anything better about TikTok and kind of my journey. And so that's that's where we are today. Present day here, three years later, we are still cranking along a video every single day on TikTok. Production's gotten a lot better. The quality's gotten a lot better, more people reaching out um, and just really starting to build a solid base. So I couldn't be more fortunate for that. Yeah, man, it's, it, you know, to give some context to your success for anybody that maybe didn't see some of the other videos we've done together, you know, you've had six figure months in GCI mm -hmm. from TikTok and, you know, you're in your first few years of the business in a brand new city. And so like you alluded to, a lot of people think that you can't get tangible results from TikTok because maybe the lead flow process is a bit quirkier and we'll get to that and you know the perception of it is that misconception is that it is dancing but you've proven very drastically otherwise so we'll get and we'll, we'll loop back to you know the strategies that you're using and the content that you're doing and how you've been able to create efficiencies because i know that's been a journey for you but first on the completely opposite side of the spectrum after all of those incredible things we have a proposed potential ban so do you want to kind of talk maybe first about what it looks like based on the knowledge that we know now, and then we can start talking about maybe some mitigation strategies or what you would do if the ban goes through that kind of thing. But first, let's start with the landscape of what is this looking like right now? Yeah, so it's it's very interesting because it's all popped up relatively suddenly. Now, it's always been in the back of legislation for a little bit. Just It's been basically bounced around from bill to bill to... For them basically to try to get it passed and so it finally got passed through one branch of the government and it, now it's going to the senate it's going to take about six weeks give or take for them to actually acknowledge it and go through because they have other things on their desk right now um but yeah it's it's interesting because now it's all being brought to light for everyone that's like oh my gosh TikTok is gonna get banned because that's what all these headlines are TikTok ban you're never gonna be able to use TikTok again and it's just a bunch of fear mongering in my opinion I mean, I was, you know, I had ABC News reach out to me, uh, our local station here, just to talk to them about what my personal thoughts were um, on the whole situation, just because I have one of the largest channels here in Sarasota. So for me, I, I hold this very true to kind of, I have a strong opinion on it, meaning that I don't, it, it could get banned and it could not get banned. However, it's going to be how you go about it once the decision is made. So for me, like there's several different options out there. So, you know, TikTok in general, everyone's worried. The whole basis is the Chinese government having your information and it, the Chinese government, obviously, you know, the, the TikTok CEO from Singapore and all these guys say, oh, you know, we have no servers in China. They're all in Singapore. They're all protected. However, under the Chinese government, they can basically request that information from any of their servers at any time, and they don't need any legislation to be passed. So they can immediately reach out to them today, get all that data from all the customers, and then the Chinese government, so they own it, right? And um, so there's that perspective, because that's the whole thing is the Chinese government owning the data, nothing else. That's basically what this whole bill is. And it, that's why they want to have TikTok sell it to a US company. So. Obviously, that's going down another rabbit hole, which we'll get down. But for me, it's like, OK, TikTok, you know, it's a Chinese based company. Cool. We all knew that going into it. We all knew about it. Signing up for TikTok. Right. And we're in this day and age. And I told like I was talking to ABC about this. I was like, we're in this day and age where whether it's TikTok, Meta, Instagram, YouTube, whoever, we're in a social environment to where any of our data is relatively accessible to all these platforms. Like we put in all of our information in Meta or Facebook, whatever you wanna call it, and they're just basically data mining you. I mean, there's a reason why, like I could be talking with my friends on my, you know, with my phone in my pocket, talking about a certain product, and later that evening, that product shows up on my Instagram feed or my Facebook feed, never typing it into Google. Like, and no one's, no one's talking about it. They're just talking about, oh, TikTok is bad. now. I don't care what your political views are on this on the whole thing, but TikTok has always been more of a, a free speech platform because it's not so much it doesn't have so much uh, U.S. influence, right? It's more Chinese influenced or you know overseas influenced. So for me, I think the U.S. government now this is getting into politics, but I think the U.S. government is more targeting TikTok because they can't control TikTok. They can control Meta, they can control Instagram, they can't control TikTok because it's overseas. They wanna bring it 
into the US so that they can easily control TikTok and control the narrative. That's just my personal take on it. That's why they're going straight after TikTok and they're not focusing on any of the antitrust stuff that Facebook has, YouTube has, any of that. So I think it's very biased of what they're doing. Now, does it have some merit? 100%. Do I want the Chinese government having my information? No. Do I think they already have it? 100% yes. We have all these platforms out there. It's basically for me to think that they don't have my information is would be stupid. Just that's my take. And, you know, some people may not like it. Some people may. But uh, so for me, it's like that's what we were getting into when signing up for TikTok and going into it. But what I see is either now TikTok has come out to say that, hey, listen, you know, if the U.S. bans this permanently, we are not selling it to a U.S. company, which means that TikTok would be banned. And, you know, that's worst case scenario. Do I think it's going to happen? No, because there's over 170 million Americans that are on TikTok in the U.S. And, it, you know, I think that it probably contributes to a large source of their funds. TikTok's funds is through TikTok shop. A lot of the U.S. population is shopping on TikTok shop, and that's where they make a lot of their money and through ads and everything like that. So if they can't do that and target the U.S. population, they're going to lose out on a huge demographic. So they'll they'll find a loophole to stay in the U.S. Right now, the other easy option is, OK, the U.S. government bans TikTok. What happens is they'll have on just under six months to find a U.S. based seller. So whether that be like Oracle or some other big software group that would buy it up or a single individual like, say, Kevin O'Leary has already come out saying that he will buy TikTok once it gets banned from the, uh, the U.S. government. So there's a lot of different people now that are kind of circling the water, saying that they'll buy TikTok if it does come up for sale, whatever. But it's at the end of the day, it's going to be ByteDance's decision to be like, OK, we're OK selling our U.S. division to Kevin O'Leary or selling our U.S. division to some other software company here in the U.S. My biggest fear, and I don't not a lot of people have talked about it, is let's say Meta wants to buy it or some other company that's influenced by Meta. Meta's already been accused of having a so-called monopoly here in social media and it, diversifying their portfolio. So now who's going to end up buying it? Is it going to be a Meta influenced, you know, company, an Instagram influenced company, Google based company? Like who is it going to be? Basically is it's going to try to because TikTok obviously caters to a younger demographic. So these platforms, maybe Facebook, which is a little bit older of a demographic, they're going to want to grab TikTok because it's going to be able to capture a bigger demographic and a bigger audience and more control over social media. That's my fear. Like I don't, my fear is mainly in that and Facebook or Google or some other big platform buying it up and then having that so-called monopoly and then obviously changing the algorithm. And what I loved about TikTok and what I always will love about TikTok is the free, the freeness of the algorithm. Facebook, at least for me, now I'm not sure about all of you guys, but Facebook for me, you know, sometimes censors content. We've all seen it in the news, like Facebook censors certain content, whatever political or whatever's happening in the world. But TikTok, it's more of like a free speech kind of platform where, yes, obviously if there's violence going on or yes, if there's harassment, stuff like that, they obviously monitor, monitor it. But they don't monitor it to the extent of, oh, well, if you believe this thing or believe in this, we're going to take it down because we don't believe in it. That's what I've always loved about TikTok. And I think and I hope that whatever happens with TikTok, they will stay true to that kind of that motto that they've always built their TikTok algorithm off of. And that's why a lot of people got on TikTok is for short form, quick news about what's happening in the world. Okay, because we all know a lot of people don't watch news stations anymore on TV. They focus on, oh, let's just go on TikTok. Let's go browse for the next 10 minutes or even an hour for some people and get quick 15 to 30 second clips on what's going on in the world. That's how a lot of people get their information today. And I think that if people do end up having to get their free speech limited, you know, and have to go to Instagram, which a lot of people do, they go on reels and everything, but is the algorithm going to change on TikTok when it does get bought? So ultimately, that's my biggest fear is that happening, is buying up, getting bought up by a US company and then getting censored. So that's kind of my take on the whole TikTok situation. Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there and there's going to be, you know, different scenarios that I want to map out for you to maybe get some insight on you know, e either scenario of it completely going away or a scenario of it being acquired by, uh, you know, a different company that still allows it to operate. So, you know, just so that people by the end of this conversation can have some sort of plan and wherewithal of, of what to do. So I guess before getting into those specifics, what are you doing right now? 
Has anything changed or what's kind of your approach over the next, you know, coming weeks or months as they're starting to figure out and iron out the details? Yeah, so that's a great question. So for me, I mean, right now it's still in its infancy stage of the banning process. And, you know, so right now, most likely we won't know for another five to probably seven weeks when the Senate decides to vote on it. Uh, whether or not it's going to either move through or it's just going to get delayed again. So for me, I'm not really too concerned about it. Uh, for me, I'm just waiting to see what happens. I'm still continuing as usual, like nothing's happening. There's no legislation in the background, nothing like that, because it may not happen or it might happen or changes may happen. But I'd never live in, OK, well, what if this or what if that? Because you're always going to be changing up everything every 10 minutes of the day, basically. So for me, it's like, Let's see what happens with the government first. Let's see if they do decide to go through with the ban, because at the end of the day, if they do ban it, we have under six, just under six months to make a decision. Like, obviously they can sell it sooner, but if they sell it sooner, most likely it's just gonna continue being the same TikTok for a little bit until they change some, change some things. But we'll have six months to make a new plan when it does happen. So for me, I'm continuing as usual up until that decision is made, and then I will have just say five or six months of transitioning or creating different kind of content that's going to cater to whatever new platform there will, there will be on. So that's kind of my plan as of right now uh, for just seeing what happens with TikTok. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. It kind of goes back to like the NAR proposed settlement right now. Everybody's all in a flap, scared, fearful. Everybody's fear mongering over it with headlines and titles. Um, but the reality is, is if we don't know the firm fix final facts, there's not a lot we can do right now, aside from being prepared of, you know, if this was to happen, then at least I'm protected. But a lot of people are trying to jump to conclusions as if there's some sort of magical answer out there that none of us quite yet know. Yeah. So, okay, you're, you're staying the course until we have some sort of answer. And there's basically one of two likely potential answers. It's gone or it's staying, but it's going to change. Let's say that it goes away. And it's not going to be acquired by a some sort of North American, likely U.S. Uh, company, and TikTok disappears. What would be your plan over those that six month period to say, hey, I've got six months to you know pick things up again? What would your advice to people be, or what would you be doing during those six months if you know that there's an end to this game? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, it's it's all a great thing, a great question, and I mean, this could happen to any platform at any given time. Which I think it's very important to note that none of us own our audiences, none of us own our following. I mean, it could be taken away with us in a blink of an eye. You can get banned from a platform, whether that be TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and you're screwed. Like you're out, whatever. Every time, all the money you've put into it, all the time you put into that platform. It can be taken away with you at a moment's notice and that's why you know on our last video call that we had or our last interview we were more focusing on or i was focusing on mainly getting more people or pointing people off of TikTok or off of youtube or off of these other platforms and going straight to kind of my website where basically i'm directing them to my vip email list and basically trying to gather as much data as i possibly can now obviously you're not going to gather data from every single follower but at the end of the day, not all those followers are going to be leads, so to speak, or business, so to speak, down the pipeline. They just may be interested in the area or they may know of a friend and they're just not that interested enough to put in their information. So for me, it's more so harvesting the people that are very interested in the area. Like I have people that, you know, register for my email list and look at my website that are maybe a year and a half to three years out, right? So even if they're three years out, that's totally fine. I still have their data, right? And that's the biggest thing for me is getting as much data as I possibly can and sourcing it through a third party website that I actually personally own that I know it's not gonna be taken down unless I take it down. So that's the big thing for me is just basically directing people, you know, on any of my videos to this website so that I can gather their data. Because at the end of the day, if any of these platforms do go down, I do have an email list or I have phone numbers, I have contacts of reaching out to those people to say, hey, get connected with me here since this platform went down or whatever may happen, right? So that's the biggest thing is being able to gather as much data as you possibly can in this time frame. Now, obviously it takes a lot of time to build stuff like this out, but it's always good to get started because I think maybe even if someone doesn't have this put into place right now, I think this TikTok possible ban 
will enlighten people or open people's eyes to maybe, oh, this could be down the pipeline for other social platforms or whatever may happen so that it may prepare people for the next time, right? So for me, that's what I'm doing right now. But if let's just say TikTok goes down, there's nothing else no one can do about it. It doesn't get bought up. For me, it's basically like, okay, every video that I've created, I own. I personally own it. I can put it on any website that I want. So I have a whole entire four terabyte drive, I think, of all my short form videos that I've created. And I continue uploading them to the drive because at any given time, these platforms could go down, but at least I still have those same exact high producing videos that work very well on TikTok. I could easily take those same videos and post it to whatever social platform that is. Now, I'm most likely, or possibly I should say, that if TikTok goes down, there may be another app that comes in to replace it. And that's for a later video or a later comment down the road. But like TikTok's a very unique app that not a lot of apps can replicate. Like Instagram can't replicate it with Instagram Reels. They can try, but it's just not the same. It's just not TikTok. And uh, so I think there may be another platform down the pipeline, you know, if something like this were to happen. But for me, it's mainly like taking all the videos I've created and being able to have that data and also have other people's information too, that I can then leverage to be like, oh, you know, TikTok went down, but here's my new platform that I'm on. All my videos are being published there now. You can go follow me there, or if I can do, you know, email marketing with them, whatever that may be. But for me, it's it's basically owning everything as I pos as much as I possibly can, so that if something were to happen, I can easily move and I can easily make that shift. Yeah, definitely. I think you know that that reminder to everybody that you should be keeping a database of all of your content is so so important because. There are a lot of times where Instagrams get taken down or something like that. And then suddenly people lose not just their content, but some sometimes it's like sentimental photos and things that you didn't want to lose, right? But you didn't have it anywhere else stored. So I think that's a, an incredible point that everybody should be taking note of. One of the other things that I want to ask you is that I know you also didn't put all of your eggs in one basket from the beginning. You know, you have not just excelled at TikTok, but you've leveraged platforms like YouTube and you've built a strong, you know, database of content on there. Do you want to talk about maybe if, if you still feel like that's of importance in terms of diversifying, you know, if you haven't yet, because you do have a bit of risk mitigation built into your business style by also leveraging both short and long form. Oh yeah, of course. So like for me, you know, TikTok was TikTok was great for me because obviously YouTube takes a little bit of time to build up the consistency, the videos, the recognition from the algorithm, all that kind of stuff. So for me, you know, talking with you when I first got started into real estate, it was best to kind of split split it off from long form to short form and mainly think of YouTube as more of a, a long form play or like, you know, if you're into the stock market, not more day trading, but more so buying and holding for the extended period of time. That's what I view YouTube as, is more of a, a buy and hold thing versus a, a pump and dump, so to speak, if you're day trading or whatever that may be. And so that's why, like you said, I did diversify both my platforms to long form and short form because you know a lot of people, they may like TikTok, they may like the short form video, but a lot of people do like a more in-depth conversation from YouTube. And like for me, I have the same exact website that I also post on TikTok, but I also do have like, for example, other lead magnets like buyer's relocation guides, Airbnb guides for the area, and a bunch of other things that people find value in, right? And it's 100% free, but in return, I just need to gather their contact info. And the best way for me to, you know, mitigate that is like, oh, people are like, oh, they'll just put in fake information and they'll get it, you know, automatically download. But for me, I tell them like, hey, if you want this information, I will email it directly to you once you give me your email. So make sure it's correct, basically. And that's that's what I've always been able to. And that's where I've been able to see a lot more of a success rate in contacts. Because at the beginning, I didn't do that. I just immediately let them download it after they put it in. But it was just fake information. Uh, so for me, that was that was huge. Uh, but for me, like, you know, I branched off from not only the real estate side of production, but also leveraging now talking about new construction and building since now we are, now I am partners in a custom home building company. And that's been huge for YouTube. 100% is, you know, a lot of people do see me on TikTok, but they're like, oh, who is this young kid? Right. And what's crazy is like we've I've gotten multi-million dollar custom home build jobs from video and they're like, 
oh, you know, we just briefly saw you on TikTok and you mentioned like, oh, you guys build homes or you're into new construction. And so I wanted to see more of an in-depth perspective of kind of what you do, some of the projects you guys are doing and so forth. And then we went onto your YouTube channel and then we saw what you're doing, saw what your GC partner's doing. You guys were talking about this. Oh, I absolutely loved you talking about this specific thing in this one video on YouTube. And I think TikTok is great because it casts a wide net. However, YouTube for me has been a huge vetting process. So like a lot of people, they're like, oh, I saw you on TikTok. Oh, but I really wanted to make sure you were legit, you were real because a lot of people can fake it with short form video, but it's a lot harder to fake on longer form video like YouTube because you actually have to know what you're talking about for five to 20 minutes at a time, maybe even 25 minutes at a time versus 15 to 30 seconds on TikTok. So for me, the diversification of these two platforms has been huge because like I said, TikTok has a wide net, but YouTube is really the platform that's reeled in a lot of these people for me uh, just because it builds a lot of credibility through people. And I love YouTube because it is more SEO driven. It can be searched on Google. Now, TikTok, on the other hand, I mean, they've gone, they've gotten to where they have SEO actually now built into it. And like, if you type on, you know, Google or anything like that, like Sarasota, Florida or something about it, some TikTok videos will pop up like on the first page of Google, which is great because now they're starting to get more of an SEO aspect to it. But YouTube has always had that. And that's what I've loved about YouTube. It's more evergreen content while TikTok is more short, snappy, like you have to catch them when they're, you know, catch them when they're on the platform, but not when they're really searching. Yeah, I love that. I think it's it's super important for people to understand that, you know, you've been able to tap into both types of audiences. And what you've done really well is there's some people that prefer to consume long and short, and you haven't, you know, limited the growth of your business by just saying, I'm only going to do one, you've done both. And so you attract both types of people. And, you know, people can find you on one validate uh, you on the other. And I think you've created a really cool dynamic there. Now, on the short form, especially leaning into TikTok, we kind of talked about, okay, what are you gonna do if it goes away? And so we've diversified, we've downloaded our videos, we can apply to whatever other you know platform might either take its place or other short form platforms that currently exist. Let's say that it stays. And if it stays, I think we're pretty, you know, everybody would be on the same page in the sense of, we'll just look to see if anything changes and carry on as is. With that being said, I'd love for you to talk about what you've done that works so well. And so there's kind of two things I'd love to unpack here, which is that how you've generated leads and then how you've created. And so a lot of people struggle when it comes to driving traffic off of TikTok and being able to capture leads. You've excelled at this more than truthfully anybody else I've seen in the industry on TikTok. What does that look like for you in terms of turning views into leads, conversations and closed deals? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's a great question because a lot of, I have agents that reach out to me too, that are like, Hey, no, like, what do you do on TikTok that makes it so successful? Because I've been posting videos and I'm not getting one single person. Right. And it, you know, I've talked with people that have found me on TikTok and I've asked them like, what made you really find me on TikTok or how did you reach out to me and so forth. And so there's a few different, few different aspects to go down. Uh, but the one thing that I've noticed is, and it's just, it's interesting because like, you know, I do green screen sometimes like that's how I got started on TikTok was leveraging the green screen, you know, effect. Now I don't do it so much. I do just more home tours and just talking about the local area. But that's really where I got my start was the green screen. So it kind of it kind of goes away because what I mean by that is it took away the quality because the green screen effect, it kind of took away the quality of a video and made it a little bit more grainy, which that was the downside to it. And that's what I did not like about it. However, a lot of people found value in what I was doing. So right now, like when I was talking with people like, oh, why'd you pick me? Or like, why'd you, how'd you find me? Whatever. They said like, one, I love the quality of your video. So it kind of breaks it down into two parts. One, the camera quality or the production quality, meaning like, oh, you know, it's not, it's, you know, you have a bunch of jump cuts, but where it's not like dead air, dead space, or where you're like, you're looking away or saying, um, a lot or anything like that. Right. It's just smoothly edited or smoothly uh, produced and you know anyone can do it you don't need a high quality you don't need a four thousand dollar camera you literally can do it straight from your iphone and you'll be just fine and a lot of people are like oh no what camera do you use and i tell them but at the end of the day i started with literally just my iphone like that was it that's all i started with and anyone can do it too because all of our phone cameras or any of our android cameras are good enough quality 4k quality to shoot 
a TikTok video. And what's funny is TikTok does not process in 4K, it processes in 1080p or lower. So like 4K camera, five or 7K camera really does not do any benefit for you at all. So, and it, you know, it compresses it all the way down anyways. And so if you compress it naturally before you publish it, it turns out a lot smoother than if you force TikTok to compress it themselves. So that's another big thing is that. But on that note, you have quality, which a lot of people wrap quality in value together. You know, when I'm talking to them, they're like, oh, I found your, your videos have great quality. And then I start going talking with them and they're like, oh, it also has a like great value. The content you put out, all the knowledge you talk about with Sarasota, we found value in that. And that's what they considered quality too. So not only you have the production side, but you also have the value side. And that's where I drove a lot of my videos from was strictly from delivering value and not expecting anything in return. That was my whole motto getting started with TikTok. So that's, that's one little branch. And then the other thing was like for my home video or my home tour videos or any of my videos in general, like literally I had a call to action at the very end saying, Hey, if you have questions about this, you can reach out to me here. And I literally put my phone number right at the bottom of the page. And it always popped up at every single video on the ending part for like the last five seconds. A lot of people would reach out to me from that. And a lot of people were surprised. Oh, you put your personal cell phone number. And I'm like, what other number am I supposed to put? I mean, like, yeah, I have a work phone and that's what I put it under, but they still can reach out to me. And a lot of people are surprised. Oh, I actually got a hold of you and not like an answering machine. I'm like, yeah, I don't know why someone would do that in the first place. So I put my personal phone number at the end of every single video. A lot of people reached out to me there. And then I also did it one more step because a lot of people are like, oh, well, what's your phone number? Like they would comment. So they didn't reach the whole end of the video because if a video is 30 or 40 seconds long, they may not watch the very to the very end. But when if people are interested enough, typically when you look on someone's profile, you see their photo and you see how many followers and everything that they have. And then right below that, it shows their bio. And in my bio, I put my phone number once again there. I don't put my email, I just put my phone number. And that's where I get a lot of people that text me because like I have a dedicated number that's strictly for texting. And it, that's how I know that they're reaching out to me from that number is because it's all being tracked from data and everything like that. So they're texting me from that, from TikTok. And so I put it in my bio, I put it in my videos, and sometimes I do tell them on my videos, hey, reach out to me at here, right? But the biggest thing for me is like, I point it out to them. Like, I don't just randomly put it on the video. I physically say it. I say, hey, if you, got, if you wanna get more in touch with me, here's my phone number, or my phone number is right below, or I actually say my phone number. And I think that's the biggest thing is, not only do people see it, but they also hear it at the same time. Because some people may miss it, if they're watching or you know if they're not listening to it with audio they're just watching it through you get them you know kind of you have a double opportunity to tell them where you can get reached out to by so i think that's also very important to note and that's what i think that i found a lot of success with is being able to do that um is just basically having those quick snappy call to actions the quality of my videos were very value driven and they did not have a lot of, uh, you know, empty space. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, let me just shoot a video, you know, and a lot of it's dead air, but you got to really think that a lot of people work in three second time, fr time frames. So like, if you don't catch someone in the first three seconds, which honestly, to me, it feels like you have to catch someone in the first minute or second and a half. And if you don't catch them in the first three seconds, they're not going to watch the next three seconds or the next three seconds. And you really have to work in those three second increments. And that's what I've been able to do to where now my videos are maybe like 21 seconds long because I'm working in three second increments instead of working on the whole entire video. So that was another key thing for me. Um, but also on top of that, it, with the quality and kind of the call to actions was keeping people engaged. So for me, I do a lot of like pop-up text. You know, I don't just shoot a video and post it immediately on TikTok. I do a lot of pop-up text on there through third-party apps which obviously keeps people's attention, wanting more to look at it and so forth. Um, and also voice over to that, just to add a little bit more personality to it. And I think that's another huge thing is a lot of people just make home tour videos and they just put you know a trending sound on it, which is great. It works great for a lot of people. But for me, I like to do a voiceover effect to where like, hey, I'm talking about the video, but I'm not physically in the video itself. I'm just walking people through the house. You know, It's a quick 30 second video. And then I do a small trending video or music overlay under that. So obviously people that follow that trending sound, they may catch that video as well for popularity, but I still deliver value through my home tour videos by adding that voiceover. And I think that's another value 
uh, proposition that I do add that a lot of people don't. Yeah, definitely. It's, you know, I, I'd love to kind of dive a little bit deeper into your content process in terms of coming up with ideas, the things you found works really well, things like that. But, you know, one of the other things that you did really well with is you created the website. And so, you know, there's there's a phase in the beginning where I think, you know, you leveraged your phone number a lot and, and you kind of drove traffic to whatever came your way. And after you put out enough content, oftentimes people will kind of find their niche, whether it be first time home buyers, new construction builders, investors, whatever. And you decided to go to that next level. So what did that look like in terms of, you know, you kind of identified that niche of new construction, custom home developers, investors, and then branding the call to action specifically to what you know they care about. Yeah, for sure. So for me, you know, I always knew and not everyone knows, but like when I got into real estate, I knew that I wanted to be in some sort of form of new construction, whether that be selling new construction, being part of the new construction build. That was just always been a fascination to me. And a lot of people probably have that fascination because it's shiny. It's pretty. It's easier to sell um, is new construction. And but for me, I didn't just want to say be selling new construction homes because at the end of the day you're still chasing after that you know you're still chasing after like oh let me just show a buyer this new construction house but for me it's more so like i told you at the beginning is building the relationships whether that be with my gc partner which we started the company with or just with other builders in the area like for me we have several different builders you know we have tra large track home builders that build 50 plus homes in a community but they all build these same cookie cutter homes. I don't really target those builders because you can't really build a relationship with them because they're so huge. I, fo I mainly focus on these builders that build maybe 10 to 30 homes a year because those builders you can build a relationship with. And for me, it was, it was great because as I started talking about new construction, I leveraged my video content around focusing solely on new construction, whether that be touring one of those builders homes and they found out they actually find the video too later down the road because I see that they like it or they start following me and their video just got a hundred thousand views and they're all happy as can be so that's another great way to build the relationship because I don't ask up front like I'm like hey I don't go for like let me be your listing agent or let me do this for you I basically go in and do the video walk through post it and most oftentimes if the video does well they will find it like most of these builders will find it because they're so small and that they're on social media all the time and they're looking in this area regardless so it's gonna it's bound to pop up on their feed because one video like i said got like 150,000 views and that builder saw it like within 24 hours of me posting it he's never followed me before in the past and it, so i think that adds a lot of value because not only is it like oh well noah you literally just went to go take a look at my house and did a video and you know you didn't ask for anything in return like I said, I do a lot of my videos and, you know, don't even expect anything in return. I think that's where a lot of the successes come is from that perspective. But for me, like these building these quality relationships with these investors and builders have been strictly from the video content that I've been able to put out. And, you know, having that knowledge in the area, because I just find new construction so fascinating. So like any new information or tidbit of information that I get from my GC partner and he tells me we have a conversation, I literally go make a video about it because I find it so fascinating. And so maybe other people may find it fascinating too. And actually they, most of the time they find it really interesting. Like, oh, well, Noah, who's also, you know, a broker, but then also he talks about new construction that most agents don't even talk about. They don't even talk about, oh, like when you're building a house, you have to look out for, you know, how far apart your studs are in these walls agents don't really care if they're 12, 24, 16 inches apart, but there's benefits to having different features in homes. And most of these agents don't know it. So it adds another layer of like uniqueness to you, another unique selling proposition that you can offer not only to clients that watch your videos, but also builders and investors, because they actually see like, oh no, you do know your stuff about new construction. I want you to sell my product. And literally what's awesome about builders is all it takes is one client and you have maybe 15 to 30 homes that you can sell versus one client, you have one house to sell or one buyer, you have one house to help them buy. But for builders and investors, you're working in multiple packs. Like my Brazilian investors that I have are also builders. They're building 15 homes this year. They'll build 60 next year. And it, I'm already the listing agent for them. Like it's just one relationship after another to be building. 
But on top of that, it's also showing them the value that I provide. Like, oh no, you have that exclusive VIP email list. Like you must have a buyer database, you know? So they see that they're like, oh, you know, I've been following kind of like your lead magnets, you know, seeing where your funnel's going and everything like that. And you must drive a lot of traffic to that, which means, you know, you seem like you know what you're doing and I want you to be my listing agent or I want you to do this, whatever that may be. It's not a direct ask. It's more so of an indirect thing that I've been able to kind of create and create kind of like this ecosystem, I would say, this new construction ecosystem for anyone to really come into for it to be an easy process for them or to easily show my value. Yeah, that that makes a ton of sense. And again, it it, it allows you to create massive leverage and scale. And that's how you've been able to do so well and continue to build this kind of predictable repeat business with people that you know are also trying to grow with you. And right. it's not just one and done. So I think that's incredible what you've done and, and being able to tap into that niche. Now you said something really important and I know that this is a common concern for a lot of people is you said, you know, I've been uploading once a day. And so what a lot of people start to feel is, well, I understand that that's important, but like, where the heck do I get enough video ideas to do a video a day? Most people struggle to put out one, two, three a week. So when it comes to your content process, what do you do to find video topics? And then when it comes to content, you know, uh, I guess production, mm -hmm. are you batching? What, what platforms are you editing on cap cut this, that, this? so what does it look like kind of on a monthly basis, start to finish for you? Yeah. So great question. So for me, I mean, like to make the biggest thing is having the efficiency put into place, because obviously at the beginning, you have all the time in the world to be doing one video literally a day, like creating one video a day, editing it a day, a day. But once you start doing all this other stuff on top of it, like production and showing homes and all this other stuff that comes, you don't have time to make one video every single day. So for me, I prioritize batching all my content. So that's what I've done, you know, is batching, whether that be two weeks of content or 30 days of content. It just really depends on the content video ideas that I have upcoming. So for me, creating, you know, coming up with the video ideas, it comes from a whole host of different areas. Like if clients are talking about, hey, Noah, I have a question on this, this and this, you know, like, uh, you know, like when they're asking me, I'm like, oh, that is a good question. Like I say that in my head and then I write it down in my notes app on my phone because I'll come back to that later or like any question that someone will ask me on a Zoom call that I have or a phone call that I have, you know, most likely they're, they're oftentimes the same questions, but like some of the times they're different. And I'm like, oh, that is a good question. Maybe I should make a video on that. So that's kind of one source of information that I get for my video content is from clients or people that I have phone calls with or Zoom meetings with, whatever that may be. Uh, but that's a very small, minute kind of like little group. But the biggest one is mainly like I use ChatGPT at the beginning, like, oh, you know, talk to me or tell me like 20 different video ideas, but you have to go hyper local. It's a whole it's a whole situation. It's a whole thing of like not training the AI algorithm, but telling them what you do, how you do it, how long so that it can get as detailed and granular as possible. So, yeah, I do use ChatGPT sometimes to create like rough video ideas. Maybe they may give me 20 video ideas. However, one video idea from the 20 could give me 10 other ones because for me it's like and the same thing with google is like i'll type into the search bar in google and i'll be like you know best restaurants in sarasota for example and then it says frequently other questions or frequently asked questions and it, then it gives you five other options of frequently asked questions that a lot of people ask and literally you can just keep clicking on each one and it batches like three or four more every single time for you so that's great because I look at that and I'm like, oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. I put it into a spreadsheet or put it into a Word document. And then once I get all those like video ideas, all these rough video ideas, I'm like, okay, I'm sure I can make probably five other videos out of this one video idea, whether that be breaking that one question up into three different questions, five different questions, or if, you know, it's a question on one aspect of real estate, I'm like, oh, I, well, I could ask this question, but on this other aspect, you know? Um, so I find that these video ideas are great because I can do, you know, I can get 20 video ideas from these sources. But then again, if you do a little bit more deeper thinking, you could be like, 
how can I get five more video ideas out of this one question? And ultimately, when you're creating a video every single day, you know, that's 365 videos a day, or if you're doing work days, 270 plus, you know, videos a year. And for me, it's like, how do you come up with all that content anywhere from 275 to 365 pieces of content? And that's, you have to get creative, right? But the biggest thing for me is like, I go on more of a, you know, if stuff is, I do a lot of like what's in the news, what's happening in the news today to help me get better ideas for what's happening. But for like these more evergreen, so to speak, videos of like, oh, best restaurants in Sarasota or top 10 things to do in Sarasota, like those videos I can repeat like maybe every six to eight months on TikTok because it is such a, it's, it's a disturbing, it's a disturbed platform basically. So like you're scrolling, and you just have to disturb people's attention span. Basically, instead of like YouTube, it's more evergreen to where they're searching. People are just on TikTok and scrolling for fun things to look at. And for me, I do more of like, okay, I have these certain like 20 video ideas that I can make every six to eight months, right? And that, sure, it's not a huge lot or it's not a lot of video ideas, but I'm growing it slowly and I may have like 50 by now. But like, for me, it's like, those are videos that I can always go back to every eight months or six months, whatever that may be to make it, you know, if I'm running out on video ideas, I can easily pop those in really quick and it's the same video every single time, but it's not the same video exactly. It's literally the same idea, but I recreate the video to maybe my different personality or like maybe how I edit it a little bit differently or, you know, my facial expression, stuff like that. It's very different, right? It's not going to be the same video as I created six to eight months ago. It has the same knowledge or the same information, but it's just how it was produced is going to be a little bit different. So for me, those are kind of where I get my main content ideas from. And then in terms of producing it, so obviously I'm batching content two weeks or 30 days of content at a time. And so depending on the video, I either use, you know, if it's a home tour video, I love using InShot Pro. That's been my go-to app since day one. I don't really use Final Cut as often, but I use InShot for everything. All my voiceovers, all my text pop-ups, all the funky text that I put on there, the colors, everything is all through InShot for all my home tour videos. That's regardless of that. And then, so for like, maybe if I'm in the studio and I'm making videos of me sitting down, then I edit all my stuff in Final Cut Pro just because that's the software I like to use here on my Apple computer. Uh, and it's easy because it's a bigger screen. I don't want to download onto my phone because I am shooting from a camera instead of a phone. Um, so it's just easy to plug in the SD card and start editing on Final Cut. But it is a little bit more advanced in terms of different plugins you can buy and all that kind of stuff for editing. But I try to keep all of those videos as simple as possible so that you know it doesn't take two hours to edit a 15 second video because that's a waste of time. Uh, but for me, you know, I use a hybrid of Final Cut, InShot Pro, and like a lot of people ask, well, how long does it take you to edit one of these home tour videos? So like my videos take, you know, I try to stay about a minute to a minute, 10 seconds on every home tour video under 3000 square feet. And then once I do that, I know I can edit it down to just about 30 seconds of content, whether that be through the speed ramps or whatever, or just blank space. I can edit it through to about 30 seconds. And then from there, that whole process of, you know, adding the voiceover, adding the text, you know, editing the video itself, it takes me about 15 minutes to edit a home tour video, which is not a lot amount, it's not a huge amount of time, but when you're doing several of them at a time, obviously that adds up. But nothing feels better than when you batch all the content, you have all the videos created, and you don't have to worry about making content for the next 30 days. Like that has been a huge, weight off my shoulders is being able to batch this content and then go about my day every other day like oh you know it's five o'clock oh crap like i don't have a video like i didn't make a video today well i go back to my little storage that i have and i pull a video out from one of the videos i created 15 days ago and i publish it and it it creates a lot of efficiencies in my business for sure is being able to batch that content but like let's just say i want to make a video a day like make this video today, whatever, you know, something may come up in my head. Um, I may make five or 10 videos just because that's what I want to do. But I do that on my free time because I already have those separate videos batched out. I don't have to worry about it. But if I have some empty space, I fill it with making other videos just because it's no, there's nothing better than having a whole bank of videos ready to make just in case if you can't make a video one day, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think I love it. Finding efficiencies and finding out what, what works for you. And I think as you alluded to, 
I found a lot of fun and enjoyment in going through that creative process of coming up with ideas, finding one that spins into multiple others. And, you know, it's kind of a creative relief for, for us in the industry that always have to do, um, you know, so much professional work. This is a bit of a fun, playful outlet if you start to actually lean into it and make it enjoyable. So, you know, there's there's a multitude of different avenues we could take on this, but I'm really excited to kind of see what does happen in the coming weeks, coming months, and be able to kind of readjust based on that. So the final thing that I would like to talk about is, you know, people do have an opportunity to partner with you to get your one-on-one -on -one mentorship to help them, you know, skyrocket their production with TikTok. What does that look like? And, and I think it's really important now more than ever that people leaning into the same platforms align with each other because you have your finger on the pulse of everything. The news is reaching out to you. You've seen success doing six figures a month GCI from TikTok. There's nobody really better to guide people if this goes away or if there's major changes. So what can people expect when partnering with you? And I'm gonna make sure to link your calendar in the description below. Perfect. That sounds good. I appreciate it. But yeah, so like, you know, the agents that asked to join me, they joined me for one reason, and that's because they want to know how to do better on social media or do better on TikTok or YouTube, whatever that may be, because they see what I'm doing, whether that be for new construction, the video I create, the production that I have, whatever that may be, that's what they're joining me for, or they want my assistance on that. So when they partner with us at the Wolfpack um, and partner with me, I, I personally like to take a one-on-one -on -one approach. I mean, Mike did an amazing job for me, you know, getting into the business. And so I really want to like replicate that in the regards of like, you know, I actually have one on one Zoom meetings with all my agents, every, you know, weekly, basically, whatever, whatever works with their schedule. That's what I love to do, because for you and me, that's what made my success was being able to talk with you personally and ask you all the questions that I needed and then go from there and take my own action. And that's what I really want to give back to a lot of these other agents. And what I do is you know, ask them, keep them accountable. Like, okay, we're talking about this this week. And then the following week, did you keep up with that? Did you do this video? Did you make this video? Did you make your 10 videos you told me you were going to make, right? If not, why didn't you make those? And how can you make it better on the next week? So for me, it's more so on the accountability side and being able to tell people or show people like, this is my creative process, or this is the behind the scenes of my editing style, or this is how I'm actually finding all these video ideas and how you can replicate it. Even though I'm in Florida, you can easily replicate it in Montana, for example, right? And that's my biggest thing is coming from more of a personal side, personal approach of, I would want to be treated just like how you treated me for, you know, coming into real estate. And that's what I do for every other agent that does join me. And I'm just basically here to be a resource to all these agents. Yeah, man, it's it's incredible because you, you've been such a wealth of knowledge. You have you lead by example. You're an incredible role model and you do have a servant's heart and you love to pour into people. So, you know, with, with not just the proposed potential changes to TikTok, but also the proposed potential changes of NAR and people wanting to not just figure out what the heck's happening with short form content, but also how to start to transition their business maybe to a more or listing dominant business like you've done, I can't stress the importance of who you surround with and who you work with matters and being able to align with people like Noah um, because of the fact that, again, you actually do lead by example and you're going to be the first one to find the right solution no matter what happens. So Noah, again, man, super grateful to have you here for the third time and hopefully not the last time, uh, but to get your insight on you know what's coming down the pipeline and how people can properly prepare today for it. I appreciate it, Mike. Thank you very much. Awesome, guys. Well, again, I'll link all of Noah's incredible content below, including his calendar, his TikTok, his YouTube channel. Reach out to him if you want to talk about partnering, getting his guidance, because that's going to be your saving grace if you're focusing on short form.